Welcome to another episode of our personal empowerment audio program, Finding Yourself in Paradise. Hi, I'm Michael Bell. And I'm Steve Snyder. And our program today is on the subject of NLP. That stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. It's actually a whole toolkit of self-help technologies to help you create better rapport, greater connection between people, and to affect state change. It's a wonderful series of tools to help people become what they wish to be. Well, there's so many fascinating things about NLP, but right here at the top of the program, it occurs to me that this whole field of rather advanced hypnosis and hypnotherapy was based largely on the work of Milton Erickson, pretty well-known hypnotist. He lived, I think, into the late 70s or maybe 1980. He was a remarkable guy. And then these two fellows, one a college professor, the other a businessman, up in Santa Cruz in the mid-70s, said, we could apply this to business. Take this clinical understanding that Erickson had about how to heal people's sadness, how to repair their emotional and mental dysfunctions with his classical techniques. Let's take that and use that in business, to influence people in business, to influence customers, but to influence coworkers and the boss. And we'll do it. There's even a book called Influencing with Integrity. But the darndest thing is, Steve, business hasn't really been all that interested. Many have. Many have not. And it went back then to the psychotherapy field. So it sort of took this little detour over into the business field, became NLP, and then came back into, as you said, a set of tools that all manner of therapists use, psychotherapists and and licensed clinical social workers use them, religious counselors, even academic guidance counselors are learning to use these really powerful techniques that were intended, again, coming from clinical to business and then got rerouted. Yeah, NLP actually began with Fritz Perls and Virginia Satir before they actually came on to Milton Erickson. But Bandler and Grinder studied the work of these three individuals, primarily Milton, and used that model the way Milton worked to do two really two important things. One was to create rapport, to create a connection with the person, how Milton was able to get on that person's wavelength to create a state of, uh, in Spanish there's a word simpatico, there's really no English equivalent, like you and me, we're on the same team kind of thing. And then once he created that rapport, how he used a different set of tools to be able to help people create change, to be able to help people change habits or behaviors or thought patterns or belief systems or just basically to go from the way they are, which they're not happy with, to the way they want to become. Well, didn't Erickson use a lot of teaching tales where deep symbolic allegory was used along with embedded commands? Lots of metaphor. That, that was his style, yeah. yeah. But all working on the unconscious level right. where the client heard one thing, might have even wondered, well, how much did I get from that session? He just sat there and told me a story without realizing that the subconscious had just, through an altered state, stood wide open to a whole redirection and a whole set of new ideas that in many cases would take effect immediately and in some cases work their way into the psyche, but some powerful techniques for change. because Milton would say stuff like, remember that time when you laughed so hard, which... You're totally in I mean, it really is all about your life. It's not Milton guiding you. Milton's giving you all these ideas that sort of trigger you, but what you choose to associate with that time really tells everything about you. And so that's why the stories were so therapeutic, because really he gave you these wide open ended ideas that you chose to associate with the events of your life and you got to heal yourself. So NLP came out of uh, Bandler and Grinder watching Erickson do miracles, you know, helping people changing the ways they live, changing the way they think, changing the way they feel and believe. And so they, they put together these series of tools and it started with the rapport building tools, the the matching and mirroring, and and really one of the biggest parts of NLP is representational systems. Now, matching and mirroring, I think great therapists and great business people and great connectors, people who are connectors, they, they do this. They they get on the same wavelength with the person they're talking to. Their, their breathing patterns start to go, they match, and, and they start, they, they notice the person's like leaning over to the left, so they lean over to the left to match, or they lean over to the right to mirror. You know, they, they either match or mirror. They either do the same thing that 
the person's doing or they do it the way the person would see themselves doing it in the mirror kind of thing. But it's very subtle. You know, it's not like an overt, you know, I'm a puppet and I'm moving the way you're moving. But we start to create a rapport by, by doing the same things and getting on the same wavelength, using the same language. Representational systems, I think, is the biggest, where people basically speak in either visual and or auditory and or kinesthetic ways. We all use all three, but when you start to hear somebody say things like, oh, I see what you mean, or I get the picture, or that looks good to me, you're getting the idea that their mind is working with a lot of pictures. And when you hear somebody say words like, well, yeah, I hear you, or that rings a bell, or that sounds good, then you get the idea they've got lots of sounds and words going on in there. And when they're talking about, yeah, oh, I can handle that, or I have a grasp on that, or yeah, that fits for me, then you get a feeling they're into their feelings. And and sometimes it smells and sometimes it's tastes. But the idea is get in touch with what they're doing and go there because it really only takes one person to create a great connection between two people if that one person goes where that other person lives. Yeah, so the idea is you then discern and match that rep system. Yes. So even if I'm naturally an auditory, if I see that you're looking at it from a very visual point of view, then I'll start using that verbiage. I'll talk not about the way it sounds to me, but the way I see it or the way that it looks to me. And and then it'll feel like you're on my wavelength. It'll feel like yeah. you speak my language. I get more influence yeah. that way. I feel safe with you. He speaks my language, right? He just sort of resonates or she just sort of gets, you know, and it's really just these three areas. One of the interesting things about using this concept to create rapport is not only the use of the predicate or the verbs and does it reveal I see, I hear, I feel, or I get my hands on it, whatever, but the way in which eye movement also reveals these rep systems. You want to talk about that a sec? Yeah, you know, and it's not a hard, fast rule because it varies from right-handers and left-handers, but generally speaking, when a person is looking up to their left, which would be up to your right, as you're seeing it, up to their left, they're remembering something. And if they're looking up to their right or your left, then they're constructing something. They're making a picture up. Something visual. Something visual. They're inventing a picture. Like, so the first is up is visual, but, but up and uh, left is memory. Like up and left, I can see a picture of Eleanor Roosevelt that I saw in a history book. But up and right, uh, there's a parrot on her shoulder, you know, because I never actually saw a picture of that. I have to invent that in my, in my mind. Oh, yeah, okay. So up and to the right would be an attempt to understand something visually that you haven't conceived of. Something pulling on imagination. Right. Not And also lying, if you think about it, because if you go up to the left, you're pretty much dealing with memory. If you go up to the right, you're making something up. So it could be inventing or creating, but it also could be lying. Be careful again, because it reverses often in left-handed people. Now... Okay, good. Having said that, the left and right is from the person whose eyes are doing the moving, not from the point of view of the observer. but the Right. If I say up to the left is memory, if you're watching me, you'd see my eyes go up to the right. There's a sense in a lot of metaphysics that energy in general moves in a counterclockwise direction. So if energy moved from left to right then it makes sense that the left would be the past and the right would be the future. That's one way I think of it. That's interesting. Of course, if it moves from left to right at the bottom, it would be going one direction at the top and be going the other direction. So. <laughs> you had to mess up my mind. <laughs> That's not how you look at it. So on a visual level, what we're talking about, when the eyes go up, we know they're, they're seeing pictures, and if it's to their left, it's memory pictures, if it's their right, it's imagination. The same thing when they go in the middle toward the left, then we're remembering something. We're hearing a voice or we're remembering verbatim as best we can something from memory. And if we go to the right with our eyes in the middle, it's, it's making stuff up. It's remembering or inventing, talking to ourselves, inventing new things. Now, kinesthetic's really different, though, because whereas visual to the left is remember and to the right is construct, and the same with auditory, left remember, right construct, with kinesthetic, it's real different. To the left is ex the, the feelings. It's your remembering and experiencing your emotions, your sensations, your, your visceral and tactile feelings, smells and tastes as well. But to the right is something very different. To the right is inner dialogue. It's like when you look down to the right, you're like talking to yourself. You're making stuff up inside your mind. You're, you're exploring. And, and having a conversation kind of with yourself in that when the eyes look down and right. 
So visual and auditory are the same in terms of the left is memory, the right is construct. But with kinesthetic, the left is sort of memory and what you're experiencing now, and the right is sort of inner dialogue. Now, each and every one of us draw upon all three of these rep systems, the visual, auditory, and kinesthetic, as Steve's gone through. But almost all of us are heavy in one area, a primary representational system, and then weaker in the other two. Some people have a sort of strong second one and a very weak third one, but basically everybody has some access to all three, but usually a pretty strong primary and a fairly strong secondary and a kind of weak tertiary. So as folks interested in human potential and personal growth, we want to develop the other two so that we have access to all three. Why? Well, three different ways of knowing and understanding things, number one. But also, it increases your ability to enter rapport with a person that you want to influence. Now, we mentioned this briefly a few minutes ago. It bears repeating. The whole idea is to do this with integrity. Whatever the nature of your ethics and your values, I'm sure we can get on the same page. We don't want to cheat people or manipulate people or take unfair advantage of people. That's very very bad karma and, and evidence that you don't really understand principles like this. As you understand principles of mine, we don't need to manipulate uh, other people. We don't need to trick them or cajole them, but sometimes to influence them for their own good, to to influence a person in business or, or at home, one of your kids or one of your parents, to learn to use better language. I mean, in many ways, NLP is just the science of the way the brain, the neuro, is impacted by language, the linguistics, neuro-linguistic programming, the impact of language on the brain, and the way language is a software. You might say, well, that doesn't really say much. We all communicate verbally with language. Yeah, but some words are more powerful than others. There are imperative statements. There are commands. There are suggestions, there are subtle seductions, there's being an authoritative person who demands that something is done, and then there's softer, gentler approaches to influencing people. And to look at the way the mind works and the way people are influenced by language, you begin to get a sense of the larger scope of NLP and what holds together, really, the basket that contains all of the different techniques. Several others we have yet to tell you about. Well, for example, language plays a great role in the tool of reframing, where, for example, somebody experiences failure, and their first thought is, oh, well, I'm bad at this. Uh, this, is, this is obviously something I should never do again, versus a person taking that thought and going, mm, wait a minute now, I, I think I can see this differently. I can see this as an opportunity that says, wow, there's an interesting challenge here for me. This could, be, this could be a whole new adventure in my life. This could be something that I get really excited about learning how to do. It's a matter of changing the language inside your mind. Because the map's not the territory is one of the great statements of NLP. Like, it, it's not reality that we're experiencing. It's our perception of reality. There may, in fact, be a reality, but all we have, the best we can do is perceive it. All we can do is have a perception of it. And, and if your perception of the reality changes, then to you, the reality changes. For example, a person goes to Kentucky, and they drive through Kentucky, and they see this sort of, uh, you know, flat part of Kentucky. And, and it's, you know, green, and it's cool, and they think Kentucky is this flat green place but that's their map of Kentucky but they don't know that there's these incredible caverns underneath Kentucky like some of the most amazing caverns in the entire world and if now their map becomes more three dimensional and includes above ground and below ground their whole idea of Kentucky changes so the reality of what Kentucky is to them when they didn't know about the caverns and now that they do know about the caverns it changes their reality of Kentucky so the map's not the territory by changing the way we perceive something we change the reality of that thing to us the truth is, most people are quite suggestible most of the time. That's mostly true, you know? It I mean, is. it's not like everybody's a sheep, but some people are sheep almost all the time, and everybody's sheep-like some of the time. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the truth of the matter is, 
and and I can I, I proved this to myself, and I think to a lot of other people in a career in radio, that's always been about why you believe what you believe. You know, the, all the talk radio programs I'd ever heard in my life were, "Hello, thanks for calling. Tell us what you think." And what I did for thirty five, forty years is. That's interesting what you just told us about what you think. Now tell us why. And to pursue that and to open people up, you find that most people don't go real deep when it comes to their rationale or their reasoning for believing this or that. It usually comes down to, well, somebody told me so. And I would say, well, who told you, right? Well, Everybody knows that this is no. Not everybody knows it's true. I don't know it's true. I'm disagreeing with you. Why do you believe that? And I just became absolutely fascinated with it. And that's really what my show was about for all of those years. Going that one step deeper and realizing that I even had to be aware of believing something just because somebody told me. Now, Maybe I heard it a bunch of times, so it got repeated. That's a factor. Maybe it came from a high, credible source. Somebody, for example, who's well-educated in this way is going to want to know the attribution. Well, where did you hear that? They're not going to give the same weight to the National Enquirer that they would give to the New York Times, for example. Somehow that's going away, by, (laughs) by, by the way. Part of the, the the problems we're having with media these days is that it's skewed from information, a desire to inform and educate, to entertainment. News is so built around entertainment now that you don't know what to believe. It's not factual. It's often made up and, and invented and... Now we have governments quoting news sources that invented the story in the first place. And the government will, or some agency will point to the story that was made up by the media as evidence that they've got to do what the majority of American people do not want them to do. It's real mind control. George Orwell, he nailed it. And and we're in the midst of it right now. News is now nightly entertainment, weekly stupidity. That's what it is. Told what to believe again and again and again. 24% of Americans believe Barack Obama is not really the president. And they want their country back. (laughs) About the same number believe that the sun revolves around the earth. Now, that's not the world. A quarter of the people of the world believe the sun revolves around. That's a quarter of your neighbors, of your American neighbors, don't have fifth grade science worked out yet. This is a little bit scary. So they're particularly suggestible and likely to believe whatever they're told, especially if it's repeated enough times. 45% of Americans don't know that the sun is a star. I mean, is that is that scary? I read that yesterday. Forty five percent of Americans don't know the sun is a star. I mean, wh- where what is our educational system doing? And and uh, you know, it's a little off the topic with NLP, but I mean, it's not about memorizing facts, but it's about like basic understanding of of you know simple stuff. You don't have to be a PhD to know that the sun is a star. Uh, what was that? Jay Leno used to do that that stuff where he interviewed people on the street. They had the most absurd Jay, notions. Jay walking. Yeah, most absurd notions. We, we need tools of understanding how people's mind work effectively so that schools can actually work and teach. You know, when we start using tools like one of the greatest tools of NLP is called anchoring. I love this one. This is where, like, you find the best of you when, when you were your smartest and your happiest and your most successful and, and you have the best of you available to you as a state that you can use and step into when you need it the most. That's one of the greatest parts of NLP, I think, is this whole anchoring idea, like finding those times, those experiences or making them up, those experiences where you feel powerful and wonderful and be able to step into that role and be become that person who is strong and sharp and, and, and brilliant in the moment when you need it the most. That's a, that's a great and powerful tool. You know, I also like the way touch is involved in neurolinguistic programming, again, in a clinical setting with a practitioner like a counselor or in a business setting, you're 
a boss trying to better motivate your workers, or maybe your boss is a little slow and you're trying to bring him or her up to speed. It could be influence you have with customers or as a customer, an influence you want to have with you know, a retail clerk or somebody you need to do business with. And to be able to touch a stranger, to shake their hand, to touch their shoulder, um, it's very, very powerful. Remember, our nature is to want to love and be connected to all things. You put a red ribbon in front of a baby, the baby will reach for the red ribbon and then put it in its mouth to taste what is this red thing. We want to reach out as the phone company used to say, and touch somebody, we want to make a connection. And so as a person who wants to be of significant influence, to reinforce that with a touch, even just to, you don't have to reach far, you know. If you have the right body language and have the right self-confidence, it's easy to reach out and touch somebody on the elbow. Or, or when you shake their hand, bring your left arm around and, and put it behind. You'll see a lot of really powerful women and men learning to do this. Bring that left hand around. and It's almost like a hug. Or to go to that. Men hug more now even in business than they used to in the West. People want the contact. Give them the contact, you know. Some You want to say something nice to somebody, you say you look really nice in that, put your hand gently on the shoulder as you say that. And suffice to say, it's just a really significant underscoring, a, a way of making an even stronger impression on the metaprogramming of language. And, you know, it works especially well with visual people, the touch thing, and it works pretty good, too, with auditories, but kinesthetics have a lot of territory issues. They like to, like, have some space, and, and so to walk up real close to a kinesthetic might make them uncomfortable, close enough to actually touch them. So, you know, and, and it's really easy to identify which they're being in the moment. It, it doesn't mean that they're always that way, but right now they're being visual. How you can tell someone's being visual in the moment is visual people talk faster than normal people do. I mean, I'm, I'm a visual. And you don't I have going, anybody in mind. No, no, <laughs> nobody at all. Visual people talk quickly, and, and, and they say things like I see what you mean and I get the picture and they look up when they see pictures a lot of pictures in their mind they look up and and they'll they'll blurt things out without thinking more often than most people will and they'll you know they'll they'll just be sort of in a hurry they you know they're, they and they like to finish other people's sentences you know uh, auditories are much different because you see they love the sound of their own voice you know they they speak mellifluously evenly not particularly quickly they enunciate very clearly they've they've spent their life listening to their own voice many people don't listen much to their own voice but auditories do and they they like the sound of that voice and they pay attention to the sound of their voice where where so they speak evenly and they look to the sides toward their sounds you know they look like not up or down but more to the sides more often and they'll say stuff like oh i hear you and that, that rings a bell and the kinesthetics are well they're more deliberate they <laughs> they speak slower they they ponder they ruminate they pause they choose the words carefully indeed and they never blurt <laughs> never ever blurt everything they say has been carefully rehearsed and considered in their mind they look down a lot you know they look down into their feelings they rehearse the words they're going to say you know self talk mental dialogue so they're looking down a lot and and they don't blurt and they don't speak as much but when they do understand it's been carefully considered it's they're the researchers they're the due diligence kinds of people they like to check things out and make sure they got it right before they proceed so they don't make nearly as many mistakes but they don't move nearly as quickly as the visuals and the auditories do and again i i, I know bandler and grinder didn't make it up nor did erickson uh it's as old as time itself this idea of being positive in our language but i, I like to mention it in the context of nlp because again it's such a, a great example i think of the difference that simply choosing words makes. I'll share a quick little story with you about this. In 1994, you and I were both living at that time in uh, Los Angeles, and there was a big earthquake, Northridge earthquake. Remember it well. Yeah. I had a library that collapsed. <laughs> yeah, books everywhere. It was a mess. Freeways collapsed. Gas lines caught on fire. It was a crazy time in Southern California. There have been worse, but... You know, everybody in California talks about waiting for the big one. 
In 94, we called this the big enough one. It was, <laughs> it was indeed. I had a friend who owned a liquor store. It was really a bad scene. Oh, I can imagine. Even the smell there oh. must have been something. Well, I had a friend on the radio who I listened to because it was one of the two all-news radio stations in Los Angeles. And he was saying all morning, don't panic. He's reading the news, and he kept saying, don't panic. And it was making me nervous listening to him, putting me on edge. This is a friend of yours. Yeah, it turned out to be somebody I knew, again, through the radio business and the union after and everything. So I finally picked up the phone about 8.39 in the morning, and I called him, and I said, Jack, what? All of this, don't panic. You guys are doing such a great job. You are the earthquake station, the go-to all-news radio station for Southern California. But you keep telling people not to panic. It's like so negative. You're scaring people. He said, Benner, what are you talking about? How else can I say it? And I said, how about remain calm? And there was this long pause. He remained calm for a moment. (laughs) For a moment. He never even had thought of it. Well, he changed the way he talked about it. He talked to other radio news people in town. The whole atmosphere changed. A few weeks later, I was thinking about these first responders, the fire department, uh, the, the police, the EMTs, you know, the first responders. And are they taught about this? Uh, do they understand the importance of language being positive? It turns out that some do and some don't. A lot of the emergency services people had never really thought about it. EMTs, a lot of firemen seem to have picked this up. Yeah, they're at least trained not to say, I think this one's a goner, you know. (laughs) Yeah, even if the person's unconscious, there's a general understanding. Most of them know that that's a highly suggestible state. Yeah, and they could very well be listening and most likely are. On some level, though in shock, though perhaps having all the signs of total unconsciousness. People come out of comas and remember those kinds of things. And not only are they aware on some deep level, but they are hyper-suggestible, even more open to a more impactful sense of, you know, it could just be an EMT expresses a little bit of doubt, like imagine hearing your surgeon say, oops, for example. Mm, mm, <laughs> not, not something good. you want to hear. Imagine hearing your surgeon at all. <laughs> <laughs> you don't want to be hearing your surgeon at all. Well, some <laughs> of us have had that experience. I've had surgery where I was, they wanted me to be awake. Oh, C- oh, cataract yeah. surgery, they keep, oh, you, yeah, okay. keep you alert throughout that. Uh, they want the feedback, but A great line that is used by EMTs and paramedics is the worst is over. That's a nice, that's nice. And everything's under control. Yeah, they used to say everything's going to be okay, don't worry. But they found that many people who were victims of injury and and like traffic accidents and such or in war, no, they knew everything. Everything's not going to be okay. No, I'm missing a leg. Yeah, it's, it's not, not okay. Not going to be okay. So you can't say that. So they said, the worst is over. We're going to take care of you. Gets better from here. Yeah. And by the way, this arterial bleeding, you can help me stop that. Just imagine that being turned off, right? And you can breathe and relax now and imagine your blood pressure beginning to normalize. Because again, we're hyper suggestible in this state that medical doctors tend to call shock. It's not really a technical term, but here again, what does this have to do with NLP? Neuro-linguistic programming, the impact of language on the brain, the learning, the understanding. The words we use with people have an impact, and that impact can last for years. And now we're talking about a situation where the words you use could save a life. Yeah, indeed. I I had an experience uh, many, many years ago where somebody fell and smacked their forehead on a brick wall and they were bleeding profusely. You know, there's more blood comes out of the forehead than almost anywhere else. And and, uh, they they were just panicked, you know. So, I mean, the the key was I knew it wasn't like life threatening or anything, but I knew that I needed to stop that bleeding as best as possible. So I locked them up and I I looked them right in the eye and said, that bleeding needs to stop now. And, And they just, they did. I mean, it just stopped 
bleeding. You know, it just they didn't have any response to that, so they did it. And the fact is, they were going to do it in two or three or four minutes anyway. The mind was going to stop that bleeding. It wasn't like I made mind do something it couldn't do. It just like accelerate the process, get that that process of whatever it was going to do to turn off that faucet. It got it to do it now. So yeah, people are in a really highly suggestible state when they're in great pain or when they're in shock or when they're in those kinds of states. You can do amazing things with people in those states. Yeah, the management of. Uh well, physical and emotional pain has always been of great interest to me. And I watch animals and the way they handle pain, for example, the pets, many pets that I've had. And they seem to have such a high tolerance for pain. And when I began to think, well, maybe it's not that they're tolerating it. Maybe they just don't experience it in the same way because they don't have the same expectation, you know. We become sissies as little kids. The idea that a, a an injection at the doctor's office really hurts. It, 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 it's like a mosquito bite. It doesn't really hurt. And yet right now, people listening to me go, oh yeah, it does. No, it doesn't. <laughs> I'm real familiar with injections. Even in my eyeball, I've had injections. No, it's all a function of of what you think and what you believe. And it can run the gamut, you know, from, we need to mention the Milgram experiment real quickly, from a horrible negative like doing what you're told in the Milgram experiment, I'll let Steve explain that, to believing in people, to to having faith in the good nature of people, to always having hope and optimism, attitude, Belief and the language that you use to express it, that's the software of programming the mind. And if you're not programming your mind, then somebody else is doing it for you. Yeah, the, the Milgram experiment is an incredible example of that. What the, the setup was somebody is standing there with a lab coat, a white lab coat, you know, with a clipboard, and, they, and another person, they say, you sit down here, and you've got a dial in front of you, and there's a person in the room over there, and if they answer the question wrong, you have to, you have to administer a shock, um, you know, and, and I'll, you know, I'll tell you how much. So basically uh, administer the shock now, and, and you hear the person go, ow, you know, and whether it's really happening or not, not it's not the issue, but the, they they said, hey, I heard him. I don't want to do any more. Well, the, and all the person at the lab coat can say is the experiment necessitates you continue. And and they're standing there with their authority. Now, if somebody was dressed like, a, you know, like with, in raggy clothes or a, some teenager was saying this, you wouldn't have done this. But it's an authority. And the, la- they're yeah, like, the white coat. The white coat. Yeah. They're in charge, you know. <laughs> so the, the experiment necessitates you continue. And so people would actually in, it, administer more and more and more painful and painful and, in fact, lethal amounts of electricity They would because, because they felt not responsible. They felt like the the experiment necessitated I continue, and they're they're told me to do it. So there was people will pretty much do what they're told when they experience that the authority in they give the authority to the person to tell them what to do. And so again, we're talking about a set of techniques, really that at first blush don't seem to be all that connected, but what they all have in common in this field the has been called neurolinguistic programming for 35, almost 40 years now. What they really have in common is the way they're presented, the language that's used, the nature of suggestibility. We mentioned positive language. We talked about the rep systems. Steve talked a little about modeling and matching. There's many others. There's one more I know you wanted to talk about. Yeah, really, one of my very favorites, uh, such a powerful technique called the swish technique. I remember one time I used this with an incredible result. Uh, I got in touch in some therapy I was doing that there was this part of me, this 12-year-old boy part of me, which is when my dad left, deserted the family, that that still felt really like sort of ashamed or maybe responsible for my dad leaving, not a good enough son. Uh, I just felt it it was a drain on my self-esteem. There was this one, like, aspect of myself that got stuck at 12 years old and my dad I wasn't good enough for my dad to stick around and and I was carrying that and it caused me in certain moods to like slump forward and to feel inferior and to feel 
you know, just like low and not very good. And then, there, of course, other times I felt wonderful, but but I had that in me, and I identified that, and this therapist helped me relieve myself of that with this great swish technique. The idea was formulate in your mind a picture. I formulated in my mind a picture, like a a, a painting size picture, big painting size picture of me looking that way. It was not a comfortable feeling, it, it was, but it, it's it's only for a short time. It doesn't have to stay. So I got that feeling. Of, I saw myself at 12, like looking sort of pathetic and sort of sad and sort of like, you know, sorry for myself, kind of pathetic looking. And and I got that, you know, really vivid picture of that. And then, and then the next step was to imagine a picture of myself the way I want to look, you know, the way I, like free of that, feeling really, really good. And make that picture a really tight tiny little picture, just a little postage stamp size picture, and put that little postage stamp size picture of me really feeling good in the bottom right corner of this big giant frame, art frame, you know. So I'm seeing this big picture of me at 12 looking like, you know, unhappy, and this little teeny, teeny postage stamp of me like vibrant and powerful. And then all of a sudden the, my, the, the, the suggestion is now switch. Bam! And all of a sudden the big picture is me, you know, powerful, and the little tiny picture is the, the pathetic little 12-year-old. And then back and forth, back, you switch them back and forth, back and forth, and, and one becomes big and then a little, and, and it gets to the point where they all get, like, in your brain all confused, and the power that your mind gave to that negative one is all now mixed up with this power that you have with this positive one. It takes a lot of the power away from the negative one, and it's a lot of fun to do, too. All of a sudden I found that whenever I pictured that pathetic little kid he was only postage stamp size he was just a tiny little remnant of what he once was and i still feel that way like i have him in me now but he's no longer this big giant painting now he's just this tiny little postage stamp that's funny you call that the switch technique swish Oh, oh I mean, it, it, you're switching back and forth, but it's actually called the swish okay. technique. Because uh, okay. originally when they did it, the sound you make when they go back and forth, like, swish, 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 swish. So that's where the name swish came from, the sound of the two pictures swishing back and forth. Oh, okay. Because I just heard the swish technique was you just put your hand seemingly, mentally, on the little picture, the positive outcome down in the corner, and then one time swish over oh, that's nice too. the whole screen. I like going back and forth, back and forth, but either way well, will work. The confusion is a yeah. nice uh, way of, again, opening one to suggestion. People, when people are really confused, like deer in the headlights confused. Stupefied. That's where stupid comes from. That's a great time to drop in a little seed. That's where you drop the suggestion. You're a wonderful person. And it'll be easy for you to remember that. It's, you know, again, like our earthquake story, you don't, you, you wouldn't say "don't forget." You'd say that'll be easy to remember, keeping the language positive. Well, let's do a guided imagery exercise. We always do it about this point in the program, and this week's no, no different. Let's get into your most comfortable sitting position. We call these audio journeys because they uh, are journeys into the mind uh, with uh, Michael's and my voice uh, going with you. That's one of Milton Erickson's favorite lines. Our voice will go with you as we take you down into this peaceful place, this place that's something we call paradise. So shake off stress and tension, some shoulder shrugs, some head rolls, and Feel the cushion supporting you, the sofa, the chair. Feel the floor beneath your feet or the pillow, perhaps, that you're sitting upon. And sit straight, though not rigid, rather balanced and feel balanced. As if every vertebrae and every disc in your spine is perfectly aligned, it's a path of least resistance. And take... A couple of slow, deep breaths, pulling in strength and power as you inhale. Hold as you peak and exhaling just as slowly. Take your time. You feel the letting go and exhale beyond where you'd normally stop all the way out. And do that three or four more times before allowing your breath to fall back to its natural rhythm and its natural cadence. And as you relax deeply, with each breath you release, washing over you a sense of inner peace. And you think, and you feel, 
and incongruence. And you understand that you have great influence. By reading other people, by getting their sign, whether they're visual or auditory or of the kinesthetic kind, you can create greater rapport, make a greater connect, because you'll be giving people the responses they expect, because you'll be more like them, and they'll be more like you, and it'll feel more comfortable being together, you two. And it only takes one to make this come true, one person to meet that other person and make it feel like it's what they ordinarily do. So get in touch with how people think. And when you want to connect, think like that. It's easy to do. And once you've made that connection to the feeling is there and it'll persevere, it'll last. You just need to make it at first, so that you feel safe and they feel safe with you. Part of NLP is feeling like we're on the same wavelength, we too. Allow yourself to remember something positive, a recent experience, an encounter. Maybe an event, maybe a relationship, maybe some sort of circumstance that for you was a lot of fun. That may even have been exciting. Yeah, something from not that long ago. That your mind now is settling in. Now, if you were a visual, you would see in your mind's eye the memories of this event from not that long ago. You would see shapes and forms. You'd see colors. You'd see motion. You'd see big and small. And So I'd like you to think now about how that looks to you, how it appears to be. What do you see as you remember visually this particular incident or event? Then move to the auditory and do the same. How's it sound? Here we go. Turn up the sound now. Bring in the soundtrack. You had the movie. Now we add the sound. What are the sounds of this event? Easy if it's loud. It's actually just as easy if the sounds are few. You just listen more carefully to the sounds. This one particular event that you see clearly and, and now hear, how's it sound to you? Listen. And then move to the kinesthetic. Feel in your body how it feels to be happy, to be excited, to be enthusiastic, to be having this much fun. You know how it looks, and now you know how it sounds. Allow yourself to feel right now. It's as easy as allowing your awareness to receive the feeling that you can so easily remember now. A visual, an auditory and in your body, a kinesthetic experience. And bring this to your waking life. Exercise the mind. Exercise its ability to perceive on all three levels. And by the way, smelling and tasting is part of the kinesthetic as well as the tactile or the touch. You know, the pleasure of massage, for example, somebody rubbing your shoulders or scratching your back. Well, that includes smells and fragrances and tastes as well. Work on all three levels. So many tools in your NLP kit. So many ways that you can influence it. 
So whenever you find that there's a picture in your mind of something you don't enjoy, here's a technique, an easy technique, any time that you can employ. Just create a picture of the way you'd rather it would be and make that picture and the old picture switch back and forth and you'll see that one gives power to the other and takes power back and it all takes the whole thing right off track and the power of the old picture just fades away. You've taken its power in this mental foreplay. Pretend that it's different and what you will find that is it becomes really different inside of your mind. The map's not the territory. It's not what's real. It's the way you perceive it, and that's the big deal. So you can change the way you perceive it. You can change it in your mind. And when you do that, what you will inevitably find, as you change your perception, it all changes too. Reality changes as you change you. So one of the powers of NLP is to be able to take the opportunity to see a better way that things could be and to replace the old picture of the way things were with this brand new picture where you're more self-assured, where you're more powerful, more confident, and you're feeling more alive. Take the old picture where you're suffering and replace it with a new picture where you thrive. That's a beautiful word, to thrive be alive, but more than that, to thrive, to prosper. Could it really begin with an attitude, a belief about yourself, a hope that develops into a dream, to an expectation, to a feeling of affirmation and confirmation and success? Why don't you just choose to model the traits of your heroes, the people who are role models for you, be like them in as many ways as possible. Integrate the best traits of the people you admire into your speech, into your behavior, and into your heart, into what motivates you. You know, it does sort of take one to know one, a rather high metaphysical principle. Why do you admire these particular traits? Maybe because the seeds are already within you, longing, in a sense, for expression. Follow up on that. Embody it. Feel it. Experience it in your body, in your mental attitude, in your emotional passion. And effortlessly, simply by forming now the intention to do so, bring this general affect with you back into the waking state, back into wide awake. As you turn your attention to what you'll see in a moment when you open your eyes, remembering the room where you sit, inhaling now slowly, fill your lungs. And exhale... And open your eyes wide awake and alert, feeling fine. Better than that, better than before, all rested and rejuvenated. And, and again, you're not carrying any of this, you know. You've put down your burden. We come out of these audio journeys, these alpha processes, unencumbered, having put down all of the negative stuff we carry, positive stuff. You don't have to carry if it's made out of love and it's true and part of our potential. It's everywhere equally present. There's nothing to carry when it comes to love and joy and a can-do attitude, a belief in oneself. You know, NLP is really an amazing toolkit, and it's based on some basic suppositions. They call them presuppositions, I guess. And and one is that communication is more than what you're saying. I mean, there's, you know, the eye movements and the body language and all that kind of stuff. And, and so you want to watch for more than just the words that people are saying. And, and that people already have what they need to be successful. That's another one of the basic presuppositions of NLP. Failure isn't really failure. It's just feedback. You know, that's, that's an attitude that you need to have to be successful. Uh, that can-do attitude. I've said several times the map's not the territory. You know, you only see what you perceive, and it seems like reality, but it's really just the map, not the territory. And 
you know, basically, if you're not getting the response you want, then do something different. That's another one of the basic premises of NLP. There's there's some cool stuff, and it's really the the hypnotism of the 21st century, I think, and it's really a, a wonderful toolkit in and of itself. You can do some amazing things for yourself and for other people with these neurolinguistic programming tools, but as Michael pointed out several times, the idea is influencing with integrity, which is a great book about these tools written by Jeannie Laborde, but the concept is really clear. We can use these tools in a in an unethical, manipulative manner, but what we're talking about is influencing people in a really positive way, influencing with integrity. Always the win-win, always for the greater good of all concerned. <laughs> Remember, you as a separated self competing with the world You don't have to sacrifice or suffer in any way to turn your attention to the better interest, the greater interest of the community at large. The greater good includes you. So always go for the win-win situation. Always don't settle for the first solution. Look for the best solution. Thanks very much for being with us. Be sure to tell your friends about FocusedPassion.com and forward the newsletter to them or use the share one with a friend to actually send as an attachment through email a program that you thought was really special and you're thinking now of somebody who could really appreciate and find value in that particular program well log in to focuspassion.com and right below the player is a link where that's so easy to do it doesn't cost you a nickel forward as many programs as you want as often as you want to as many different people as you want free of charge once you're a subscriber to focusedpassion.com and as always be gentle love life and take care of each other for steve snyder this is michael benner aloha from maui